Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. This is JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, thank you for joining us, especially during these trying times as we face down COVID-19 by social distancing and by working, learning, and networking virtually. As such, these JSA virtual monthly roundtables have taken on truly a new relevancy as a timely platform where we can seek advice and information, even answers to our questions from top industry thought leaders as we face these latest challenges of today's new reality together. And also hopefully as a little bit of sunshine at your door today, we have provided lunch or if you chose a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So for those of you who received, please enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started here. And a quick reminder, this is a roundtable format. We really want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice. We want to help answer your questions. So go ahead and type your questions in our question box. And depending on time, we'll get to as many as possible. Additionally, as these are necessary conversations for our community right now, JSA just added a whole new series on the impact of COVID-19 to our industry and target verticals. Mm -hmm. This is the second of six roundtables in the in the series. Next one up is on Smart Cities and IoT, the new world of COVID. That roundtable just two weeks from today, April 16th, and then how the outbreak impacts healthcare, education, and financial verticals, respectively. New dates freshly posted on JSA.net. Go ahead and check it out. Register and let us know any speaker suggestions you may have. So let's get started with today's topic, the impacts of COVID-19 on data centers and technology. And to underscore the importance of today's chat, we have 282 registrations. Um, so thank you guys for joining us today. And we only announced this roundtable literally two weeks ago. Um, so uh, really uh, underscoring the importance again of today's conversation. And I, and I also want to note that within a day of announcing this topic, we have all six of our all-star executives dedicate their time for us today, within a day. Um, so thank you, everyone. And, right. and to help us introduce them and to guest moderate our panel, please welcome my friend, Evan Christel, the industry's top social media influencer, not like one of the top. We're talking top in our industry for social media influence. Uh, he, he drives social visibility and engagement for big brands like Intel, IBM, at t Business. And kicking off today, our formal partnership um, we humbly add JSA and our amazing clients to his portfolio. So a friend and partner. Evan, thank you for making the time to be here today. And the floor is yours, my friend. Thanks very much, Jamie. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, it's really a delight to be here and with this amazing group of folks personally and professionally. This is now my social outlet for the day. So. Afterward, we'll have to grab a, a virtual cocktail. Um, uh, but let, let's start with uh, Mike Hagen at Edge Micro. Uh, Mike, for those who aren't aware, Edge Micro is, is, is one of the fundamental building blocks in the data center and the edge uh, of the network. So you're really in sort of a pole position to share what impacts you're, you're seeing in the network in terms of, uh, you know, expenses, network expense, capital expense impacts, uh, obviously the human and operational side. Uh, so Mike, please share with us a little bit more about what you're seeing uh, uh, at the moment. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, my co-founder and partner, Greg Patin, made a great comment today on our team call, which we're, you know, we're all doing in different ways and hopefully more frequently, which you know, is kind of a defining moment, right? So uh, we've spent a fair amount of time talking to customers internally, our prospects and, and our, our mentors to get our arms around this and, and, and did a lot of reading, right? So, you know, I think the, the, the hard part of this is, you know, when you have a crisis, you know, there's always a chance to learn or take a new lens or, or we all as a group in the business world have to take a different look at what we've been doing and what we should be doing. Um, so, if we move into the collective solving mode uh, in this ecosystem, which is the edge in the entire system, we've, we've learned a lot and heard a lot. So the challenges are really new. 
I mean, we have seen some of the impacts in major cities regarding co-location facilities that are massive and centrally located that have uh, limited access to workers and staff. Certainly a challenge we've not experienced before. Um, you know, we've seen the stay at home work environment blow up the network, right? We've all seen the data, whether it's go to, you know, go to, go to meeting or Zoom or Teams, the numbers are astronomical. Um, you know, we see things and have had discussions about the what ifs. The what if is as we move through this and solve for the challenges we have, what portions of our workforce will stay at work home environments and what does that do to our network? What does that do to company performance and communication? So with crisis come new opportunity and challenges, but um, you know, you know, fundamentally uh, one of the things that's been most encouraging to me is how you see our industry and people come together. So my final comment is, you know, we've, we've been chunking away at this for several years to be the platform of choice at the edge. And part of that is to kind of glue the ecosystem together, which includes uh, cellular providers, MNOs, the MSO cable providers, fiber folks, to get everybody connected at the edge for the greater good of everyone, everywhere. And we've all read it. We've seen how those teams and those groups have circled together to collectively work to solve for some pretty big problems. So with my glass half full approach, um, you know, I think it's just opportunity for all of us. And, you know, rather than sharing numbers and what we've seen on backhaul, those types of things, I think there's a new light on the edge in the industry in general. You know, we, we've always talked about latency, 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 but now I think everything's moving into bigger and broader discussions, you know, on hub and spoke, um, security, bandwidth impacts. So um, yeah, that's really been the core. And I think collectively we're all starting to solve together and look at how we change this environment so we're better prepared for the future. So while it's yeah, great, positive, great insights, great insights, Mike, and we'll come back to you. Thanks so much. It looks like the future has arrived a lot earlier than we had anticipated. Uh, Jason uh, Byrne of NetSapiens, you're known as one of the leaders in deploying applications and value-added services on top of the network uh, at NetSapiens. Jason, what have you seen on the application side that, in terms of impact that you might be yeah. able to share? Yeah, great question. Um, and I just to follow on, on some of Mike's comments. Um, so we're in the cloud communications and collaboration. Uh, we provide platforms and service providers. And our service providers have seen a massive, massive uptick in, in support tickets as everybody has moved their desk phone and their, their networks basically back to that house. So it's been a huge shift um, in the industry. But the good news, we're all, you know, that all the folks on this call are, we're all cloud, um, you know, applications or cloud providers. It has become very seamless. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head, Evan, is that the future has come far quicker than we thought. But I do think we are very well uh, equipped to take, you know, to really uh, make sure this is seamless as possible. And I think we've seen it, you know, so folks were calling into our customers saying, hey, how do I move my office to my home? And the simple answer of just plug it in, it's the cloud, I don't care where you are, um, was a great answer to have for, for folks. And, and then it went from 300% increase in tickets to, to zero, right, once we got that message out. So it really is, um, it's a huge impact in the industry, but I do think the industry is equipped for it. Um, and I think we've got a lot of folks in this call that can really dive into the, into the backhaul side of things and what they're seeing. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's hard to imagine how we could even live at the moment without all of those cloud-based services and applications we're, we're yeah. using uh, uh, at the moment. So so thanks for that. Uh, Rosa White, uh, DR Fortress, um, I'd love to get your perspective on data center and colo, but, but please don't share the fact that you're in Hawaii and don't <laughs> don't open your window, uh, whatever happens. But besides that, any, any of your insights would be appreciated. Well, I just want to let Mike know that, Mike, I've always been on the edge <laughs> uh, in our data center. So, um, well, with Hawaii, I think that um, the, one of the biggest and first things we started focusing on is both our employees and our customers. 
um, both of them were scared, really, the both sets. So we, it, we, you know, we had to immediately figure out which of our employees were, um, you know, non-essential in the sense that they could work from home, whereas our operations and facility team, not only were in, we in the middle of huge projects, a UPS upgrade, but we started seeing a lot more requests for remote assistance, customers quickly wanting the cross connections for all the new networks. So not only did we have to deal with making sure we had the right people at the data center at the right time, but dealing with um, just customer demand that we just weren't expecting. We actually did some analysis on tickets and visitors and they've all gone up in the past two months. So we haven't seen the stay at home for the IT folks and for you know critical mission um, activities. So we've had to quickly adapt for that. That's been one of the biggest challenges for us. Um, and then of course, being able to uh, make sure that the team kind of stays intact. So we've had a lot of, well, we had a couple of challenges in, in Hawaii with the um, various video providers, right? It, it was a latency issue. Uh, everyone is in Hawaii is limited to a certain amount of bandwidth. So we had to figure out what worked best, what platform worked best. So we had to do a lot of testing. Um, in fact, this morning I had some issues even logging into this. So it's just one of those things that we've needed to stay nimble and flexible and just work with what we have. And if that doesn't work, quickly shift and move on to something else that works. So that was kind of one of our first things that we had to focus on is taking care of our employees, making sure they were comfortable, and then mm -hmm. focus on our customer demand, which instead of us having a ghost town of a data center, we had lots of people coming in, wanting to hug their servers one last time before they were first forced to stay at home um, and make sure that they were being safe as they were coming into the facility. So we have some uh, not as not customer friendly signs in our facility saying, hey, if you have a fever, stay outside. Uh, we will give you free remote assistance right now and just take care of what you need. So we don't want you in our facility. And so we had to send out customer notices to that effect, just trying to stay friendly, trying to help them out, but also protecting everyone else inside the facility. Oh, thanks so much. That, that's really helpful and, and fascinating to understand the, the, the psychological human side of what we're all going through. And on, on a side note, if you need any hands-on technical support, in the data center in Hawaii, please. I'm volunteering uh, Thank for you. that <laughs> in, in the near future. Uh, ben Edmond of Connected to Fiber, uh, hashtag Boston Strong, another uh, Bostonian here on the call, which is good to see. But you have kind of a, uh, a, fa a fascinating view of the broadband landscape. Certainly, the FCC has been making some uh, unbelievably aggressive, fascinating moves lately in regards to broadband and wireless. So, what are you seeing from your sort of perch? Uh, of, of the uh, broadband think, industry. Yeah, thanks, uh, Evan. I appreciate that. Uh, we're in a unique position at Connected to Fiber, building out a uh, industry cloud for the connectivity uh, ecosystem, and uh, and today have over 350 million locations uh, in the platform. And one of the things that we saw is just uh, the reality that connectivity is critical now more than ever. Um, you know, the shift to work from home, you know, the uh, the increased engagement online um, all has a pretty uh, profound effect on our ecosystem. And, you know, queries were uh, significantly up inside of our ecosystem where the connectivity in industry and service providers uh, trying to understand who has what where and communicate with each other. And uh, you know, we think it's a really you know, critical point in the, uh, in the overall industry. You know, digital transformation doesn't happen without connectivity. And it doesn't happen without the right architecture to support that connectivity, like what Mike's doing out at the edge uh, uh, with, uh, with Edge Micro or what uh, Rose is doing out in Hawaii. Ultimately, it matters and enables not just how we work, but how we educate, how we govern, how we entertain ourselves in the future. And I think, you know, that light is being shined very brightly on our industry right now. And, you know, what I see is the industry is responding, uh, you know, uh, with outstanding uh, uh, vigor. Thanks, Ben. I look forward to more insights and go Sox, uh, go Pats. Uh, I just slipped that in. Um, Mark Halpt of Databank, uh, 
by the way, I like your background. Is are those actual books or is that a virtual background? Uh, no, uh, they're they're actual books. <laughs> okay, I stopped reading in 2017, so I, I just wasn't okay. sure. But um, at DataBank, you talk about the uh, the evolution of the network, but what we're really seeing is is kind of a revolution. I mean, we're you know this is uh, un, unexpected impact. What what are you seeing on the data center side? Well, I'm seeing a couple of things on the data center side. So um, one one of the things is I'm I've seen for about a month now is that people are finally getting serious uh, about having to deal with this problem. Um, but it's still a situation where the different markets are are taking it differently. Um, you know, I have data centers across nine different markets in the United States, and those that are on the East Coast, uh, the data centers out there are taking it a different, a different sense of seriousness than, let's say, some of them uh, more West or more Midwest. Um, there, there, there tends to be this um, interesting mindset of uh, of some of the the employees as well as the customers. The, it, it, you move to the Midwest, you move more west out to Salt Lake City, that area. Uh, there there tends, tends to be a little bit more of a mindset of uh, don't tread on me, if you will, um, in, in regards to uh, restricting access or putting in controls. But as the COVID situation grows, for example, you know, like I said, mentioned the east the eastern side. As Indianapolis now has become a quote unquote hotspot or a potential hotspot, according to the Surgeon General and frankly the data that I have, I've seen our customers in Indianapolis starting to take it more seriously and even report to us when they see other customers that are not following the uh, the guidelines that we put in place uh, within the data center. So like Rosa identified, you know, we, we are not restricting people from coming into our data center per se, but there's a list of rules, a new rules, if you will, uh, for coming in. And, and some of those are, you know, if you have been sick, uh, even if it's not COVID, we're asking you not to come in. We are offering the remote hands type of function and people are taking that uh, and, and using that. So probably, you know, one of the biggest things I've seen is the different mindsets across the country, uh, and and as the the virus progresses, uh, they're changing a mindset and, and changing thought process. Um, I, I think also there's a lot of companies that we're dealing with that are scrambling uh, right now, as has been discussed here by the other members. I know I I put our our pandemic plan uh, back in late December, early January, we took our general pandemic plan and I made a COVID uh, pandemic plan. So from that perspective, we were a little bit ahead of the curve, um, but still getting people to accept the fact that we're moving early in February, that we're moving into this type of situation was, was somewhat difficult, but now we're, we're kind of glad that we had that in place and we've been able to enact uh, various aspects of that. So we've been able to protect our people and, and, uh, and work with our people on that. Um, you know, from, from a customer perspective, again, um, they've been thus far uh, very, appreciative of having the systems up and running and knowing that there's security in place, uh, physical as well as logical security in place so they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, if somebody's breaking into their systems when they can't, as as Rosa was talking about, kind of can't give them one, their servers one more hug. Um, so there, there's that kind of assurance that, uh, that we're working with with our customers as well. Um, even to the point in some cases, uh, sharing video screenshots or or other uh, new pieces of data from physical access control lists, things like that with our customers so they can see who, you know, from, from their own employee perspective, who might be breaking their, their own internal rules and actually coming into the data center to work there instead of uh, the office because it's closed and, and you know, that where they should be working at home. So there, there's various aspects that are coming into play and the mindsets are different as you move across the country right now. Thanks so much, very, very helpful. Um, Lee Kirby of Salute Mission Critical. Uh, first of all, let me salute you. Thank you for your service. How many years? Uh, 36. 36, uh, well, that's, that's just incredible and I uh, can't thank you enough. So what are you seeing, you and your team of, of fellow veterans and more in terms of what your customers are doing and seeing and how are they managing through the crisis? 
it's kind of fascinating. We deal in eight countries and we deal with the U.S. And the U.S. currently is like dealing with 50 countries because we don't have a universal national response. So our health and safety team has been issuing guidance almost on a daily basis because one of those 58 entities is issuing new guidance. Uh, nothing's a panacea. We may never get to a national plan, but I think it shows in the development of plans in the future that if you're dealing with regional versus national versus a global crisis, it changes how you react to things. Your supply chain changes. Everything that you thought you might be able to get to in a regional crisis is different when it's a global crisis. So our teams are on site helping our clients not have to get people on site, dealing with enhanced protocols to make sure that the environment is uh, mitigated on risk and that people can still operate. And I think from an industry perspective, this has really recognized how really critical the data center industry is and that we've had no problems in any of the countries we've had to be able to move resources around because they're considered an essential workforce. And seeing that recognition at the, the state level and the country level has been reassuring that I think I've always heard the term um, that the mother of invention is necessity. I think also the mother of adoption is going to be necessity. You see all kinds of new work patterns coming up and the infrastructure was there to support it, but it was hard to break the old mold. Now that we've had to break the old mold, I think as we come out of this and start reassessing, you'll see a, a lot of different work patterns. There will probably be less people at the data centers in the future because you can remote in and have an engineer walk a technician through a complex maneuver that has to happen in the data center and have engineers covering multiple data centers remotely rather than being at each data center and a variety of things like that. But we've been very fortunate with the clients we work with. They had regional plans in place and have been able to augment them to become global plans and execute. And seeing that across the board in the industry has been reassuring that even though we've had problems, I, we have enabled the economy a very fragile economy right now to be able to work remotely and continue on. And I, I think that's a testament to the industry as a whole. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And thanks for what you and your team do. And I, knowing veterans, they're among the most flexible and adaptable uh, folks you will meet. So much needed in, in this crisis. Um, so we're back to Mike, it's like Hollywood squares here. So we just keep going around uh, uh, the circle. So in terms of you know, data centers, we often talk about maintenance and maintainability, and we're always talking about that in terms of automation, but you can't automate everything out of a, of a system or a network. So what, what are the human capital challenges you're, you're seeing, Mike, at Edge Micro in terms of, uh, you know, the current challenge? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, because of the nature of our business, we've always taken a little bit different approach of the necessities of operations and maintenance because Edge Base has different requirements, clearly. Uh, so if you look at the past, you know, there's always been in the industry a lot of talk about lights out operations and, and what that means and what level of security or services may or may not be positively impacted. So for us, um, Lauren Zweig, who runs our operations and maintenance group, really put a pretty nice foundation in place. What was our core? At the edge, you're going to be lights out and there will not be staff. It's just that simple. So uh, what do you do to make sure our customers feel safe and secure and we can respond accordingly? So, you know, we put the proper procedures and partners in place and documentation uh, to make sure that we function in the right way at the right time. So, A, we're already in the lights out mode and B, you know, a big, a big part of our core is what does security look like and what are the requirements and what are the remote hands? uh needs of our clients when they deploy um how do you manage out of band connectivity right um when one of our users uses needs to use their back door to uh install or modify equipment so i, I think that for us we're kind of in a lucky spot because we were distributed and by ourselves out there we have a pretty good foundation but as lee mentioned and everybody's mentioned everything has to be rethought now. And um, again, you know, some of the discussions we've had have been primarily about what are the benefits of distribution, because there are pluses and minuses. What workloads 
did we think could only survive in a core data center that might be considered to be put somewhere else? And then tying that together is kind of what Ben said. Um, we can all talk about how to distribute for safety or performance reasons to the edge, but if we're not getting it connected, you know, who cares, right? So um, for us, finding a way to better utilize existing infrastructure, fiber aggregation points, et cetera, is really key to all of us. I mean, the fact is we put a lot of stress on the system, but the system is the system. So how do we utilize it more effectively? Try to keep more traffic close to the consumer, uh, manage the backhaul challenges that current infrastructure may or may not be able to support with our standard growth, let alone post this crisis. So, you know, these things are uh, you know, just from a macro perspective. The, the healthiest thing that I think we can all do is react quickly to serve our, our customers and our families, but um, be diligent in broader thinking and solving these things collectively together. I mean, the final comment on that, whether it was lights out, remote location, um, you know, how do we use our current resources more effectively quickly? And that could be bandwidth, uh, that's terrestrial connectivity. But you know, interestingly, we saw the MNOs get together and start sharing spectrum to meet the needs. So um, there are lots of solutions, but I, I think more than anything else, there's a pressure point that you know our edge, edge industry has been looking at. And the common statement was, is our infrastructure today, our internet infrastructure today, the right one to serve the needs of the future? And um, I think our eyes have been open to question that even more effectively and uh, we'll work harder to evaluate that and, and see what we can do short term and long term to make sure we all stay connected and communicating and serving our clients and, and our customers. Wow, that was really helpful and insightful. And as a glass half empty guy myself, I appreciated the optimism, even even me. Uh, Jason from, from NetSapiens, you know, we're, we're going to get through this crisis at some point, although it, it's hard to, you know, imagine that at the moment. How do you see the cloud communications industry and, and it's emerging from this crisis? I mean, what are you anticipating over the next two years, for example? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I think one of the key things right now is I think everyone's in this, this mode of really maintaining communication and that connection both with your co-workers and, and your customers. You know, I think people are finding, you know, successful remote working requires a high level of attentiveness uh, to communicate, much more so than, than, than even face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, that face-to-face -face quickly, the lack of face-to-face -face certainly quickly becomes sorely missed. So, you know, along came the age of video conferencing and that's just kicked off. And, and we've talked about some of the crazy growth with some of the numbers like Zoom, and some other folks have, you know, and they've really permeated every part of our, you know, it's our house. Our house is now where our business is, uh, from virtual classrooms in here to virtual sports training going on in my garage. Uh, it was certainly taking a big chunk of that, um, and certainly some of the some of the other vendors as well go down that path. But really, video conferencing is only we're seeing only half of what remote working toolboxes need to be. Um, collaboration tools. And I think some folks touched on it earlier is we really need, need to have uh, collaboration tools as an essential part of your remote working. Things like sharing screens, um, sharing applications, sharing your browser to, to file sharing, really have that connectivity um, across not just the visual video conference, uh, really becomes a, an effective part of, the, of your toolbox to, to connect with coworkers and your, excuse me, and your customers. And this is certainly becoming more and more prevalent. Like you said, the future, the, I saw a report uh, recently, and this was before the pandemic, that I think 60% of, uh, of business meetings happen in person. Um, and the forecast was 2024, and we'll only be down to 25% meetings in person. But this was pre-pandemic. So we were heading this direction. And uh, to your point, that future is now. And I suspect those numbers will be far less than 25% for face-to-face. -face. So we've got to arm the, the customers and, and uh, employees with the tools that so they can achieve the same outcome, 
but without that face-to-face -face, uh, visit. And, and you'll find, we're finding service providers, so we sell platforms into those service providers, um, those collaboration tools, which we just launched, the collaboration tool um, added onto our communications this morning. So, you know, you know people are starting to embrace this. Um, you know, we're starting to really use it effectively. And I think over time, you know, the noise score for, for um, remote working, I think has been permanently increased. Before, like I said, it was perhaps, who knows, 10% for remote working. But even after this pandemic, that noise floor for remote working will be huge compared to what it was before. Some might never go back. Um, and that's a big change in the industry, big change in every industry. But we're just part of that cloud collaboration uh, platform or industry to really enable folks to do that. So we're seeing a huge uptick in, in both in uh, interest and signups and uh, and growth. So it's 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 great to be part of that community, and I think that Sapiens is is lucky to be uh, to be right in the middle, embracing all of this change. Yeah, that's a great point. At Nidlo, we we say, well, remote work is now just work. Uh, yeah, there's no dis distinguishing the two. And, and Jason, I, I think you and your core team are in San Diego. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes, and luckily we've had some bad weather, so a lot of folks staying indoors, so that's a good thing. Between you and Rosa, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really getting depressed here. But right. okay, say yeah. la vie. So, so Rosa, what what about you and your your team uh, at DR Fortress? Uh, you know, how do you see the data center emerging from the crisis and and uh, changed? Well, as as Mark was saying, I mean we. We, uh, we always had a crisis management plan. We were required, especially in Hawaii, you have to be ready for tsunamis and hurricanes and other natural disasters. So we've had multiple um, emergency plans put in together. Um, and we've always had a remote work plan in place. We had multiple offsite and cloud-based servers for my accounting systems, my CRM systems. We, you know, we use Salesforce. So We've always been ready for any sort of crisis, never imagined something as drastic as this pandemic. So we had to change the plan um, similar to uh, what Mark had to do. Um, so we had to quickly adapt to, to those things. So that was number one. The other thing that we had to address is um, like equipment spares. That's, we, we're, we're never gonna look at that as lightly as we, we had. We always had critical components for some of our critical systems. And so now we're, we're addressing like, what other critical components do we need to keep in the facility in the event that, you know, manufacturing become, overseas manufacturing becomes an issue and some of our key uh, vendors aren't able to deliver those components on a timely basis. So we had to address those. We had to address, um, we have a third party security um, that contract that we use. Well, we needed to figure out do we have enough trained security guards? We have SLAs. So unlike Mike, we, we don't have a dark site and we have customer SLAs that we need to be with 24 by seven security guards. So, you know, pandemic or not, we need to make sure that we're meeting those contract obligations, making sure we're not breaching any of the SLAs. I mean, we have to report those on a monthly basis to some of our customers. So we needed to make sure, hey, let's quickly get two or three more guards um, trained. So there were extra operating expenses that all of a sudden we're incurring. And of course, this is the CFO perspective. So I'm sure, you know, on the IT perspective and technical perspective, there's other there are other things to worry about. For, but for me, it was making sure that we're safeguarding our revenue streams, safeguarding, you know, testing our PL and our liquidity to make sure that we are able to meet all the, not just to, at, at customer SLAs, but any obligations, any covenants, that type of thing. So taking a pause from everyday operations and going into safeguard mode, what things do we need to make sure that we're ready to address and ready to meet in the event, you know, something happens. So we had to kind of slow down. It was kind of scary working fast, but slowing down to make sure that we go into um, offensive and defensive mode on some of these obligations that we have, not just to our customers, but to our investors, to our financial um, institutions, uh, you know, our audit teams. So it, it was a real big shift in just going for following our standard crisis mode 
where it's just something that you know lasts for two days or three days or maybe a week at most if you're dealing with a hurricane versus something that, that could be very, you know, it's unknown on how long we're gonna be impacted. So we had to shift our crisis plan into more of, here's the short-term things we need to do. Let's get the proper people cross-trained, more security guards ready to go, spare equipment on site, <clears throat> on site as we're getting a massive um, influx of cross-connection requests. But then long-term, what do we need to do? Making sure that we can meet all of our long-term obligations. So it was kind of different. It was, um, it, 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 our new crisis plan is this long-term crisis plan that we had to kind of develop on the fly. Wow, thanks so much. Yeah, that's really insightful. Generally, I haven't been a huge fan of CFOs, but Rosie, you really, you really <laughs> brought me around. And I'm really changing my opinion uh, uh, on this call. Uh, so Ben, you've been around the broadband telecom space for a long time. You, you, you've seen uh, kind of the slow and, and fairly deliberate ways most telecom providers move. Uh, I think they're being forced to change. What, what are you seeing in terms of how they're reacting and uh, uh, what changes can we expect in terms of our industry over the next couple of years? I think... Uh... <clears throat> You see a number of different uh, things happening in the industry that uh, that ultimately I think are very positive and uh, will strengthen the ecosystem even more than it is today. Um, one of those things is the, the reality that it is an ecosystem to serve the needs of government and business and uh, even though the work from home consumers, it requires the ecosystem to cooperate in the physical architecture, the uh, the services, the flow of information to fulfill that. And we're seeing that taken to the next level because of this crisis. You know, people want to get more systematic and more transparent on the details that help them operate in a ecosystem where there's not a person out on site at the edge, where it's a challenge to get in to install a new fiber connection where people don't want to send uh, field technicians out three times to discover where the entrance facilities are, not just because of a cost savings for uh, the CFO's role, but because they want to mitigate the risk of you know, critical team members. And uh, the awareness of that leads to action, and we're seeing that action in the forms of systems and communication and collaboration, whether it's you know, work that uh, that uh, the MEF is doing uh, on serviceability to help the ecosystem uh, interoperate the work, you know, work that companies like ours that connected to fiber are helping embrace, you know, ultimately it, it does matter and we're seeing a, a recognition of that. I think we're also seeing a recognition that, you know, as well as the industry's handled the connectivity, uh, you know, burst in demand, there is still a significant amount of uh, physical infrastructure and architecture that needs to be deployed. You know, with uh, 5G, fiber, and spectrum, you know, the, ultimately, you know, it requires physical infrastructure. Not everywhere has it. Um, to solve latency challenges in Hawaii, you know, things need to physically change, not just uh, activating more capacity. And uh, I think there's a lot of great dialogue in the industry going on uh, between the, the physical network operators, the data centers, the cloud platforms, and ultimately the managed service providers that play an integral role of you know, orchestrating across all of it. And uh, I think that will continue for some time. Wow, great takeaway. Thanks so much. Mark from DataBank, uh, if we were to fast forward 18 months from now, uh, how do you see the, the data center space uh, changed uh, from the current crisis? I think you will see more data centers. I think you will see more capacity within the data centers. I believe that what we're seeing right now uh, is that companies are proving uh, that work from home and that SaaS applications uh, are working and that they're actually keeping their businesses up and running. Uh, there are many businesses that three, five, ten years ago would not be operating right now had we had they not moved to the cloud, had they not moved their their enterprise 
uh, data centers off to a co-location type of facility. So I think that you're going to see a, an upturn in the customers that do, in fact, put their data centers, uh, their enterprise data centers or their, their products into the cloud. I also think you're going to see cloud, cloud and product diversity, meaning that uh, right now we have a situation where a lot of customers are, maybe they still have an enterprise data center, but they've put a number of pieces into the cloud or they've, they've replicated their enterprise data center into the co-location environment, where now they're going just to simply replicate it uh, to multiple uh, co-location environments. So I think we're going to see that uptick. On my side, specifically from a security perspective, we're, we're probably going to see our customers wanting to dive deeper into our security practice and the audits are going to get more cumbersome because uh, they're, they're probably going to want to see now how ticketing systems uh, can remain secure because as they're doing remote hands orders through tickets, as they are putting more uh, information, if you will, into the ticketing system in order for us to take action on it, they want to see that more secure. Uh, they want to see ways that uh, phone conversations, for example, that they have with our support teams are not going to be um, intercepted or, or ways that, they, that we validate our uh, our customers on the other side before actions are taken. So you're going to see those kinds of uh, requests coming into uh, into the audit teams, the compliance teams, the security teams, uh, and we are going to have to start incorporating those processes and those controls in a more public uh, audit, if you will, like a actual control set in an SSA 18. Um, whereas right now it, it may be lumped into other pieces of a particular uh, control. I think you're probably going to see the same thing with physical access control. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, you know we've got some companies that are uh, validating that their employees are not coming into the data center when they're not supposed to be at work, and instead they are staying at home. So we're going to see different types of reports that are going to be required to come out. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things that are going to be happening, and I think one of the biggest shifts doesn't it, it goes back to my first point is you're going to see a I believe we're going to see an exodus of people from the cities into more suburban and rural environments. Uh, there, there's been a it's going to reverse the trend. There has been a trend of moving into the cities. I think that's going to go back out as people personally uh, look at the risk that they have of being in high density situations. And so you're going to have bedroom communities like the community that I live in who have bandwidth challenges and now have more bandwidth challenges um, a as a result because, you know, a population of 15,000 is all of a sudden maybe going to be a 20,000 or even greater uh, type of solution or situation. And the solution to that is we're going to have to bring in more fiber and we're going to have to bring in more, uh, more bandwidth to those facilities all of that of course coming back to you know the edge data centers like mike is talking about like like what we have at data bank is is the the edge type of solution i think 5g is already been on an uptrend and i think 5g is going to be one of those solutions uh, that people use for connectivity as they move more into a rural type of environment. And of course, that impacts the data centers as well, having to deploy, uh, you know, customers having to deploy their products closer to that 5G edge uh, is going to be more, more and more important. So as a result, we're going to see more pop-up and smaller uh, data centers. You know, right now, you know, Databank has some data centers that are 150,000 square feet. I think we're going to see start seeing, you know, 2,000 and even uh, maybe even smaller square feet uh, type of data centers in smaller communities like mine uh, so they can really be at the edge and then pump it up to more of a core data center or more of a, a larger tier three type of data center uh, as as we move forward. So there's a lot of factors involved. Um, you know, security is a big piece of that. You know, how, how do you secure those 2,000 square foot data centers in, in a lights out type of situation that satisfies the customer? How do you satisfy the customer it, it, with the ticketing system when you have some of your folks working from remote? Do we now have to start uh, dealing with BYOD, the bring your own device type of situation more, more so, or do we simply deploy some of our uh, security tools that we've paid for uh, that are on our enterprise or our local workstations off to personal workstations? And if so, how do we control that licensing and how do we control the updates 
and a personal machine versus a corporate machine. So lots of things are going to be changing, I think, in the next 18 to 24 months and even beyond as, as people as people disperse, as people rethink their their situations. And, yeah, and great, I, great insights, Mark. And if I could jump in here, Evan, um, we have some great questions coming out on the board. I know we're sensitive for time now. So I just want to get to at least one. It's a combination of Ian uh, Horowitz's and Ben Clark's. Uh, they're both um, looking, looking to understand the impact that you may see on your staff during these times. Are you responding as people leaders to engage with this change? Uh, Lee Kirby, maybe uh, uh, you're the man on the front line there uh, from getting your, your vets to text. Sorry, I was playing with the mute button. And from the staffing side at the on-site, we're seeing, uh, we've been espousing since the beginning that you need generalists on-site, engineers can be off-site. And we were fortunate we implemented our global command center this year. And that's been a, a panacea for us because we've been able to have people remote in, help the technicians out on-site to be able to do complex tasks. But in the meantime, they can do all the general tasks and reduce the number of people on-site. I think that's a trend you're going to see is there will be less people on site because you can have people doing security as an additional function to facilities and move ad change and rounds and reads. And people are going to think about how they staff those sites just from a human capital. That may have a consequence of helping with the personnel shortage. It could give a little more structure to what we see on site and off site. So I think there's some good value in looking at what you're doing on site today and what you can do on site after this crisis. And thank you guys. Thank you so much, especially today for joining us and providing your insights on the impacts of COVID-19 on data centers and technology. Our all-star panelists, Jason Byrne, SVP of Products Marketing for NetSapiens, Lee Kirby, co-founder and chairman of Solution Critical, Mike Hagan, co-founder and CEO of Edge Micro, Ben Edmond, CEO and founder of Connected to Fiber, Mark Halk, CISO of DataBank, and Rosa White, CFO and founder of DR Fortress. And a big thank you also to our guest moderator, Evan Christel, top social influencer, thought leader, and JSA partner. Um, thank you for keeping us on point today, Evan. And we should note, Evan and many of our speakers have agreed to stay on for the remaining lunch hour. To answer any more of your questions on LinkedIn, use hashtag JSA Virtual Roundtable as written in that chat box to find us and continue the chat. And viewers, if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we really hope you enjoyed your lunch today. And go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for any upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our new series on exploring the impact of COVID-19 on our industry and client verticals. Up next in just two weeks from today, April 16th, uh, we will be talking smart cities, IoT, and COVID-19 with guest moderator Peter Murray of Dense Networks and top executives from TBI, Highland, EX Squared Technology, and Redline Communications. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA Podcast. That's on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. Basically, anywhere you're looking, you can find us. Go ahead. And until next time. Happy networking and please stay safe, my friends. Thank you.